Good morning. Good morning. The mic, mic works. Okay. Well, thanks for coming, Ron. We're delighted to have you here, and we're going to jump right into things. Um, I wanted to talk about Twitter first, because Jack Dorsey's coming here later, and they're going public. They're doing so well. I want you to take me back to when you first invested, and what you saw in them, and how you first invested. Uh, sure. Uh, I got to know Evan Williams because uh, back in 1998, uh, we invested in Google. And so we knew Google from the early days. And Google acquired Blogger from Evan. That's the company that Evan founded. And so I got to know Evan through that. And then over time, Evan left Google and went uh, to start an incubator called Obvious Corp. And Odeo was one of the companies that, that was incubated at Obvious Corp. And Odeo was in the podcasting space, which was very interesting to people at the time. And uh, I invested in Odeo. Odeo ended up not doing well. The podcasting space did not blossom. And um, Ev, to his credit, felt so bad about Odeo going out of business, it was Ev's second startup, uh, he gave all the investors their money back, um, which was pretty amazing. And I said, Ev, you don't need to do this. You know, investors should are big people who know that you can lose money. 40% uh, of all of our startups go out of business completely. We don't get a nickel out of them. And I said, Ev, you're just in that bucket. Don't worry about it. And he said, no, I feel so bad I want to pay the investors back. And I said, fine, but whatever you do next, I'm investing 75K in that. Uh, and the next startup was Twitter. And so... <laughs> you lucked out there. Yeah, well, I, what was it about Ev, though, that made you say, you know, I'm in the next one, just count me in? Well, it was that he had such amazing human feelings about feeling bad about going out of business. Um, and I had tried to help sell Odeo. We tried to get Odeo to a soft landing, and I can't even remember, maybe we did. Um, but but he, he felt bad about it, and I said, wow, what, what a great person. You know, at SV Angel, we invest in the people first, and when you have somebody do something as impressive as that, um, you, you want to invest in the next one. And when they said Twitter, I said, hey, I don't care what it does, here's the money. So when he said, okay, Ron, here's what we're doing, here's what you're investing in, what did you think? Well, he was nice enough to say, you should go talk to Jack Dorsey, because Jack, you know, Twitter came out of the mind of Jack Dorsey. And so Ev said, hey, one of our partners at Obvious Corp is, is Jack, and, and he, has, he has this product vision for Twitter, and this is going to be the next company that, that we all spend a lot of time on. There were other companies in Obvious Corp as well, but Twitter was the one they took the spotlight off of Odeo, put it on Twitter. And I went and had lunch with Jack uh, over in South Park in San Francisco, and I, I just said, hey, I'm investing, tell me what it is. Um, and what did, what did you think when he said, here's what it is, 140 characters? What was your um, reaction? Uh, my reaction was, hey, great, let's see if it works. And, and with any product, it's do the users like it? So if the product takes off, it's a good product. Uh, and like Facebook and Snapchat and so many of these others, uh, it started taking off right away. And the, the big problem Twitter had was keeping up with the growth. Uh, the fail whale became more prominent than the bird. Let's, um, speaking of Snapchat and, and, and Pinterest, um, and I'll throw in Facebook, you invested in all of these very early before they were big. I'd love for you to just remember back to what the founders were like or what you thought about the product way back when they started. I guess Snapchat's newer, but the other two are yeah. older. So, so Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest. Pinterest. So, uh, well, well, I feel like we've talked about Twitter. Um, uh, Facebook... Uh, so, Facebook, I started with Sean Parker. 
because uh, we invested in Napster, then we were the first investors in Plaxo. That was Sean Parker's second company. And so when Sean became the president of Facebook, he came to me and said, hey, you know, come and mentor me and Mark. Um, and I said, great. Um, and so the first time I met Mark and Sean, funny enough, it was just a few weeks after they had moved to California, and the pro Facebook metrics were, were already like this, going straight up, just, just like Twitter a few years later. And you, you never argue with the metrics. So um, th the amazing thing about Zuck is, is the vision and confidence that he had, not arrogance, but confidence that this thing is gonna keep growing. And at the end of the first meeting, I said, hey, how many users is this thing gonna have in a couple of years? And, and he looked me in the eye and said, 300 million. Uh, and it ends up, he, he was off by 700 million because Facebook has over a billion users today. Um, but, but he was thinking big then. Um, I feel like you, with Facebook, I, I know you've told me that you were a little bit skeptical about the social networking thing at first. Um, but you must have seen something special in Mark. When well, what, I, what, what, what got me excited at Facebook was the growth. You know, the user adoption and engagement. The amount of time that people were spending on the site. So, e e even though I'm not a big Facebook user myself, even today, uh, you never argue with the users. And Facebook was picking up users, you know, very, very quickly. So, if you look at you know, we invest in people first, so Facebook, I was investing in Sean Parker's reputation and then learning about Mark. With Twitter, it, it was, I was investing in Ev and learning about Jack. Um, and then fast forward till, you know, a year ago, we see Snapchat. Now with Snapchat, I could see the pattern recognition. You know, so Facebook, Twitter, you have Instagram in there, even though we didn't invest. And then you have Snapchat. So Snapchat's one that, that we said, wow, this is probably gonna be a big app. Because there is this phenomenon happening right now um, where human, where, where applications and, and social apps in particular are changing the way people behave and how they communicate with each other. And Facebook, Twitter, and Snapchat, and Instagram prove that. And so this, there's a huge opportunity for more companies in this space. Any idea what those will be? Uh, I don't, because I'm not a founder, but I'm sure people out oh, no, there no, no. have ideas on what, what is the next social app. Because social apps are changing the way people communicate. Um, you know, Facebook adding photos was huge. People started communicating with photos. And now you have Snapchat, which is really just photo messaging. I mean, who would have pre predicted that even three years ago? Um, Do you think the founders knew they, they were going to just explode like they did? Because all, all of these stories have that in common. Can't argue with the, the user growth. Well, there are a lot of companies, though, that didn't explode uh, that are in these spaces. But, but I think every founder thinks their company is going to explode. The founders whose company don't explode and they keep iterating until it does are, 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 the, are really unsung heroes. That's a good segue, actually. Ben Silberman of Pinterest was here last year, and I love his story because it was a really long road for them, both with users and with getting investments. Do you remember when you first met Ben and what made you think they were good? Yes, uh, uh, Ben's, Ben and Pinterest is a great example of a founder where it didn't explode right away like Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Ben Silverman had to keep iterating for a year and a half, which we heard about uh, when he spoke last year. But here's a guy who is very persistent and stayed close to his users. He had focus groups, mainly with groups of women, that he, that he would bring together in a coffee shop, and then he would call them the next day to make sure they were still using the product and keep getting feedback and iterating until the product took off. Uh, in the case of Pinterest, uh, you know, I didn't discover the product, 
Um, at, at SV Angel, we meet once a week for four hours. I, I chair that meeting. Because uh, lots of people think I'm not involved in SV Angel or something because I'm involved in philanthropy and civic engagement. But, but no, 80% of my time is still spent on investing and helping companies. But, but I'm not the picker. The rest of our team are pickers. And a couple of years ago, David Lee and, and Kevin Carter said, hey, Ron, listen up. This is an app that we think is going places, Pinterest. And Pinterest was in its infancy. And we co-invest with Shanna Fisher on the East Coast, and there's nothing like a woman's intuition. And Shanna Fisher was barking in our ear as well, saying, hey, this app is really, really cool. It's where people pin their aspirations. And so, so I didn't discover Pinterest. The SV Angel team and Shanna Fisher discovered it. But I went to meet Ben, and what I saw was a very unusual entrepreneur. Because um, a lot of you entrepreneurs are, are outspoken and aggressive. So entrepreneurs are, you know, type A or, or you're in the Ben Silverman category, very shy, soft-spoken, um, but very cerebral and thoughtful. And so the first time I met Ben w was, was in Mountain View. Um, and I think we were chasing an allocation for the next round. So I was saying, hey, Ben, what can I do to help you? Uh, which is how SV Angel operates. We just go to the entrepreneur and say, give us a hard project and we'll fix it. Um, and all startups have hard projects. So Ben gave me a few projects and off we went. But, but what I noticed about him is he's a founder that actually has a calming effect. So there's a lot of founders who at the Friday team meetings wind up their team. In the case of Ben Silverman, he winds up the team in a cerebral way by actually making everybody calm. Yeah, I, I noticed that as well. He's it's, very calm. Uh, it's amazing. And he's rifle focused on the product. And entrepreneurs like Zuck, Jack Dorsey, and Ben Silverman are successful because they, they didn't care about the outside world. Uh, all they cared about in the early days, uh, and today as well, is, is the product the best it can be, and are users loving it? And, and you know, I don't want to do a press interview. I, I don't want to be distracted. I just want to keep building a great product. And those end up being, becoming great, big companies. Are you able to tell us any of the hard projects that he asked you to do? Uh, that's, that's a, trying to think. <laughs> Were they all related yes, to the fundraising? Yes, here. You, you know, with, with Pinterest, lots of introductions. Hey, let me introduce you around at Apple. Uh, l let me introduce you around uh, at various companies where they didn't have relationships. Um, and, and that can bootstrap growth. You know, if, if, if the iPhone is your first uh, platform and and we can help get you in front of people at Apple uh, because Apple respects your judgment, uh, that, that'll help a company grow. I ask because I actually have sort of inside knowledge on all of the hard problems, or most of the hard problems that Ron has helped the Y Combinator startups fix, and most of them can't even be told uh, in well, public. Well, and most we've of them- have asked you to solve our problem. Yeah, most of them have to do with, uh, with funding. So most of the, a lot of the hard projects are funding or in, in a lot of cases, M&A transactions uh, where, where we don't publicize the activity. But, but with Pinterest, we've, with all of our companies in general, we always help with the Series A round and then if the company wants it with the ongoing rounds of financing as well. So we probably can't get into that one even though there's a great one from a hotel room. Yes, with, with Airbnb, that, that one's been discussed quite yeah. a bit. Okay. I won't, well, let's talk about fundraising because I did have um, a question for you on that. I'm going to jump to that quickly. What do you see with the founders? What are the biggest mistakes that you see founders make in fundraising? And what are some of the best qualities that people show when they're fundraising? Um, I guess the biggest mistake I see uh, with founders in fundraising is founders are not focusing enough on finding the, the investor who can add the most value. 
Uh, a lot of founders are worried and concerned about valuation and dilution. And I think valuation and dilution is secondary to if you can bring in a top tier investor who adds value to the space that you're in, that's worth, that's worth millions and millions to your valuation. You know, in the case of Airbnb, they had a, a host of investors trying to invest. This is, you know, it's heresy because we had the negotiation in a hotel room when we should have had it where Brian Chesky was staying, which is at an Airbnb uh, a host location. But, um, uh, but what Brian Chesky got that night was, oh no, we should go with the investor who adds the most value. So Andreessen Horowitz invested uh, at a multi-billion dollar valuation, but there were other investors who even wanted to pay more. And, and I said to Brian that night, hey, I, I think Jeff Jordan at Andreessen Horowitz could do a lot for this company. And Brian Chesky, for the next year, every conversation we had, which is often, um, he started with thank you. And I go, what are you thanking me for? Oh, thank you for Andreessen Horowitz and Jeff Jordan, because Jeff did this, this, and this today. Um, so pick the right investor and not optimize Yeah, pick, pick a value-added investor. Um, uh, the other thing is keep the process moving quickly. For sure, get one term sheet ASAP so you have a forcing function. Because investors really don't like making decisions as quickly as an entrepreneur needs them to make a decision. So if you can get a forcing function, which is basically a term sheet out of anyone, then you can truthfully call the other investors and I can call them on your behalf and say, we have a term sheet. We're going to accept it in 24 hours. Do you have a term sheet? You better hurry up and submit it. Um, and we did this during the Airbnb financing. There was all kinds of disarray and we just said, hey, today's the day. Everyone submit your term sheet by five o'clock or you're not in the running. But if you get one term sheet, you can do that. Um, so, so keep the pace up. Don't lose momentum. And then once you get any inkling of an agreement, send an email that commits the investor to that agreement. Um, very, very important. So that you're not being annoying, just follow up. Yeah, it's just a short email, just confirming dot dot dot. You know, and it's just confirming that that. Uh, well, in the case of some commitment, I am delighted that you committed to invest at a hundred million valuation. My lawyer is going to call you tomorrow. Then it's in writing that that investor has committed. Because have you seen over the years we have fuzzy seen memories? many, many uh, transactions that fail because somebody doesn't remember what they said. Um, you think of it the happens even more on, on M&A transactions. You know, if we're trying to get a company a soft landing and we get the soft landing committed, um, those are the ones that, that people will try and wiggle out of. And, and a soft landing is when someone gets acquired sort of early on. Yeah, basically where, hey, this is not going to be the next Facebook, Let's, but we have a great product. Let's take that product and, and make it part of Facebook. And when you put Facebook's user base with it, you know, we can fulfill the dream of the product. And that's where you see people not confirming and getting into trouble. Yeah, correct. Because there's, there's optionality on transactions like that. And in the case of the company, the startup needs that transaction to happen so they don't end up with the pressure of, fi of fill. Yeah, they don't have a whole lot of leverage. But I imagine you, help, you guys help out in that area a little bit. Yes, we <laughs> help out a lot. Um, so digging down a little bit into founders again, um, like what are sort of promising signs that you see when you meet all these people? Um, the, well, I, I think product focus is really, really important. Um, and I, I didn't realize this probably to the last, you know, I've been angel investing since 1994, only in internet software companies. And, and we invest in people, we invest by intuition. But it's in the last five years that, that I've really looked for founder qualities that say that they're rifle focused on the product. 
the quality of the product. You know, Ben Silverman, Jack Dorsey. Um, it, it's just crucial. Uh, so when, when we see that, that they don't want to be distracted because they just want to focus on the product, and we have lots of uh, bloggers and press people who call us and say, hey, get Ben Silverman to talk to me. And Ben Silverman, no, no, no. Well, eventually you say, hey, why won't you talk to this guy from Fortune? Because I'd rather work on the product. I'd, I'd rather get a million more happy users than talk to somebody at Fortune magazine. That's a great entrepreneur that's on their way to building a big company. The other factor that we look for is decisiveness. Um, it, it is so important to make decisions and keep momentum in growing your company. And, uh, you know, founders make lots of decisions about the product. You know, let's change this on the product and we'll get better metrics. You need to use the same skill set for building your team and deleting from your team. You need to hire fast and you need to fire fast. Um, because if there's dead wood in your company, everyone in the company already knows it. Uh, if you know it, everybody else knows it. And you can actually make morale go up if you make a decision that, hey, that person's not working out. Even if they're a co-founder, you've got to make those decisions. And I imagine you see people struggle with that a lot because it's hard to yes. fire co-founder. Th and that's why I'm talking about it. <laughs> you you got to be decisive. You, gotta, you have to have a clear vision. Uh, uh, when I'm talking to an entrepreneur, I'm saying, are other people going to work for him when he or she tries to hire somebody? Are you a team builder? Are you a leader? So even though these companies are young and only have five people, when I'm talking to an entrepreneur, I'm saying, wow, can, can this person manage a thousand people? And there are types of people where, where I nod to myself and say, yeah, that person can manage a thousand people. What if someone, when they're first starting, really can't manage a thousand people? Are you able to say this person can grow, or have you seen examples of people who have grown into that role? Well, yeah, I think I think in the early early days of of Twitter, um, I think Jack Dorsey had trouble managing, and Jack Dorsey thought about his shortcomings and went and made Twitter better, then left Twitter, invented Square, you know, how obvious, plugging a, a credit card reader into, you know, the, the earplug of an iPhone. Uh, I got the very first demo of Square uh, from Jack and watched him build Square flawlessly, hiring a management team that, that, that if he has a deficiency, he makes sure to hire somebody really powerful in that area. So recognizing the deficiency and then building your team around that with everyone recognizing what everyone's deficiencies are. Yeah, that's growing and maturing you know, while you're building these great companies. So I think we have time for like two more questions. Wow. I know it went so quickly. I think you can tell me if these are good, because we've got to end on a high note. You've been doing this for like 20 years. Um, what has changed and what has been the same since when you first started and now? Well, uh, a lot of things have changed. Um, if, if you think back to when I started my first company, Altos Computer, in 1979, in order to, I know this is unbelievable, but it's important f for this group to know it. In 1979, to get your company funded, you had to be growing, you had to be doubling every year, and you had to be at least 20% pre-tax profitable. So investors basically would only invest if you were already successful. So it wasn't really venture capital. If you go today, just the cost of starting a company is tiny, and there's lots of people willing to take risk and invest. So the climate for starting a company is significantly better today. Um, uh, the other thing is mobile. Um, watching, watching the internet convert from the web to mobile, you know, this, this thing's not a phone that's in your pocket, it's a computer. And what, 
you know, some of these social apps that are running on the phone first, it, it, it's so, so, so different from everyone writing, you know, for the web. Now everyone's uh, working on mobile apps. Uh, companies are moving to cities. Uh, I think that's really interesting too. There's this migration, especially of the social companies, to cities. Uh, another phenomenon is, you know, you know, back, you know, when Google started in 1998, the algorithm was the intellectual property. Today, it's the user design and the user interface that leverages an application. So the world has shifted from algorithm IP to design and user interface IP being the most important. So there have been lots and lots of big, big changes. What about last question? In all these years, what have you been surprised by? Um, the, the biggest surprise and satisfaction for me is watching entrepreneurs mature at the speed of light when they have to. Um, so if you, you pick uh, uh, Larry Page at Google, um, uh, Jack Dorsey, Zuckerberg, uh, Ben Silberman, these companies take off. Those founders have got to mature, manage thousands of people, and keep their product focus. And all four of those examples they met the expectation. But think about what happens when they go home at night. You know, their companies are hiring 10 people a day and they're forced to mature and adapt to that growth. And these entrepreneurs are doing it. And watching that happen and helping them do it is the most satisfying thing you'll ever do, which is why I'm not retired. Well, awesome. Thank you so much, Ron. <laughs>